Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you tonight. And um, it's always good for me to spend time with Pastor Ken just this afternoon, briefly before I went to uh, the Abolish Abortion event. And um, when I got to that roundabout, I felt like Ian Paisley. I had to shout at the top of my voice. I felt like shouting, never, never, never. (laughs) But, um, you know, we give a shout out for the Lord and the Lord was glorified and that's what's most important. Um, It's wonderful to be with you, as I've just said. And and I've got a word um, that I'm looking forward to bringing to you tonight from Acts chapter 1. If you have your Bible, um, we're going to read from verses 12 through to verse 26. I've entitled this little message tonight, brothers and sisters and friends, Jesus is praying for you. Jesus is praying for you. We're told these words, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which was near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered amongst us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, which is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his, um, for it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all this time that the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they've put forth two. Joseph called Bersabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And when they had prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven disciples. Father, Would you shut us in with yourself tonight? Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit would do that work that we know from the scriptures that only he can do. And that is to convict of sin, of righteousness, and of coming judgment. Lord, encourage your people tonight. Challenge your people tonight. Lord, if there is someone sitting here, may this, that's not saved, may this be the very gate of heaven for them. I ask these things for Jesus' name's sake. Amen. As I said, I want to bring you a message tonight, brothers and sisters and friends, entitled, Jesus is praying for you. And I want to start in verse 12, for we told these words, then they, that's the disciples, returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. Now, when I read this verse, as I was preparing this message, immediately went back to to a while ago when I was in Jerusalem with a friend of mine called Warren from our own church fellowship. And the highlight for me was standing just outside the Garden of Gethsemane at a little kiosk, and it was heaven on earth. I had a magnum ice cream on my left hand, and I had a bottle of Cokes here on the right hand. And you know, as we were there, we reminisced what had ha- about what had happened on that mountain and in that valley, uh, uh, the Kidron Valley, over thousands and thousands of years. And of course, uh, what was most important to me is that it was the mountain where the Lord Jesus himself would have often went to. 
It was from that mountain, brothers and sisters, that he descended in his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It was from that mountain that he gave his great Olivet Discourse, speaking of all of the signs of the end times. It was from that mountain that he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and of course he suffered such agony that night. It was from that mountain that he ascended back into heaven, and it's to that mountain that he will return again. And you know, it's from that same mountain that these disciples here make their way into Jerusalem, which we're told was little, was a Sabbath journey, which was little less than a mile. Now, verse 13 says, and when they had entered, that is the upper room, where they were staying, and just let me say this before we go any further. When it's the word staying there, it doesn't mean that these disciples were sleeping in this room. It means where they were gathering. Now, who um, lent this room to them? We do not know, but we surmise that it was the, maybe the mother and father of John Mark, who, of course, went on to write Mark's gospel. And then we're told in verse 13 about the names of the apostles. Verse 13, Peter and John... James and Andrew, Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the son of the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. You know, I find interesting, the full title, as I've often said, of the book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles. And you know, brothers and sisters, it's strange that with that being the case, that these disciples are only ever listed once in the book of Acts in total. And we never hear of many of their names again throughout this book. Now, why is that? Well, you see, there is a way in which Luke wants to write this book. He's got a specific purpose. The big idea of the book of Acts is that God wants his kingdom to advance. Would you say amen to that? It's summed up in verse 8 of chapter 1. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And just as Jesus wanted it, that's how Luke records it all worked out in the end. You know, that's why we're told in the first seven chapters of Peter and John's ministry to the Jews. And then if you go into chapter 8, you'll hear about Philip the evangelist and how after the persecution of Stephen, he goes as far as Samaria and he preaches the gospel to the Samaritans. There is advancement. And then if you go on into chapter 9, you hear about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And then if you go into chapter 10, you read about Peter, and how he went to Cornelius' house, and how the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and how they were saved, they were baptized, and a door was opened unto the Gentile nations. And then in chapter 11, you read again after the persecution of Stephen that the ordinary believers went as far as Antioch, and the hand of the Lord was working with them, and a great revival broke out in that city. And then in the chapter 12 to 15, we read about Paul and Barnabas ministering in Antioch and then how they went to the island of Cyprus and then from Cyprus to Asia Minor, planting churches, making their way back to Antioch again. And then from chapter 16 all the way to chapter 28, we hear about Paul's missionary endeavor to the Gentile world, eventually finishing in the great city of Rome. Brothers and sisters, all that to say this, God has not called us as Christians to be keepers of an aquarium. Would you say amen? God has called us to fish for men. And he wants the kingdom of God to advance. And you see, as I look around this church, I can see that the spirit of God is moving. The kingdom of God is advancing in your midst. And you should be encouraged tonight. Then verse 14. We're told all these, that's the disciples, with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. And notice this, they were of one accord. And you go to Acts chapter 2, it tells us the same thing. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place and of one accord. And there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. You one man said the miracle of Pentecost was not the sound of the rushing mighty wind. It was not the, the visible tongues of fire. It was not even the conversion. Do what he said? He said the miracle of Pentecost was getting 120 Christians in the same room to agree on the same thing. Right. That was the miracle. 
of Pentecost. And you know what, brothers and sisters? The reality is they didn't always agree. Would you say amen to that? They didn't all think the same. They didn't all act the same. They didn't all look the same. They didn't all have the same interests. You take Matthew, the tax collector, for example. He was an enemy to his own people, lifting out taxes from his people to give to the Romans. And the Lord puts him in the same band with Simon the Zealot, who was a dagger bearer. He hated the Romans. I would think that it was hard enough getting these two men to be civil to each other, never mind working together for the glory of God, and yet Jesus puts them together. No, brothers and sisters, one accord means that in spite of their differences, they had the same passion and they had the same goal. That is, that they loved the Lord Jesus Christ. They were coming together excited in the light of all that he had accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. And they had a heart to do his will and to live for his glory. Doesn't this show us tonight that God does not agree with lone rangers? Oh, I love the Lord, but I just stay at home and worship God. No, brothers and sisters. The Bible says we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, and so much the more as you see that day approaching. Doesn't this again show us tonight that unity in the church does not mean conformity? There can be Bible unity, and yet there can be diversity. And yes, we have to agree on the fundamentals, but we do not have to agree on the secondary issues. And, and if that was the case, the church would be pretty boring, would you say amen to that? There's diversity and in, in unity. And yet we can still come together with this common passion to meet in order to carry out his will and to live for the glory of God. And that even comes into play with regards to the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. There's diversity in the gifts and there's diversity in operations. Do you know, brothers and sisters, 1 Corinthians 12 tells us as much as there is diversity and variety in the body of Christ, it's the same Spirit who gives the gifts to all. So it's the one source that the gifts come from. They're used in the one body, which is diverse, but they're for the one goal, which is for the upbuilding of the fellowship and for the glory of God. And you see, because this is the case, we should be humble and work together. Would you say amen to that? Because brothers and sisters, do you see, if we can't appreciate one another and one another's giftings, you know what we're actually saying to the Lord? We're actually saying to the Lord, Lord, you got it wrong. You didn't wire me right, but he certainly has. In verse 14, we're told that they are together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. You know what I love? I love that Luke emphasizes over and over again, not just in his gospel, but also in the book of Acts, the importance of the women in the New Testament church. And all the sisters said tonight, I was miserable. <laughs> I would imagine Mary Magdalene would be there. Mary and Martha would be there. Joanna and others would be there, but most prominent was Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I think it's interesting to note that Joseph is not mentioned here. That's because, no doubt, from the, when Jesus was 12 to the age of 30, sometime during that time, Joseph, his father, would have passed away. And the responsibility for not only his mother, but the family would have fallen upon the oldest brother. And you know, brothers and sisters, I believe that's why, I know there's divine timelines as to why Jesus started his ministry when he did, but I also believe there's natural reasons. Isn't it wonderful that he would have waited till his younger siblings were up and he looked after his parent? You see him even in his dying breath. We're told that they're gambling for his clothes that his mother has made him. And we're told they're stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. And that's when he says to John, he says, Son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. And that was saying to John, take her to your home and look after her the rest of her days. And you know, brothers and sisters, of course, the Catholic Church has de deified this, this lady. They, they venerate her. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure Mary would be alarmed at these things, but never forget that this woman was a believer. She loved her son with a passion. And isn't it wonderful to see that she is here. And when the day of Pentecost has fully come, she's filled with the Holy Ghost with the others. 
And then verses 15 to 20 is really what I want to speak about tonight. We're told these words. In those days, Peter stood up amongst the brothers, the company of the persons who was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered amongst us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now, listen to these details that Luke gives. Only a doctor could give these details. Now, this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out and it became known to the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that that field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. You know, last week in the morning, I spoke to our church about the ascension of Christ, what Jesus is doing now as the risen ascended Christ. And I talked about the fact that when he ascended on high, he poured out his spirit upon the church. And by the way, he's still pouring out his spirit upon the church. I talked to the people about how the risen Christ is still building his church. And how does he build it? He builds it by saving men and women. He builds it by searching the church as well. He builds it by sustaining the church. But thirdly, I spoke to our people about Jesus is standing even now, brothers and sisters, at the right hand of the Father. And as our great high priest, he's interceding for every one of us. That should be so encouraging for us tonight. For it's wonderful to have godly people pray for you. It's wonderful to have your pastor pray for you. You know, the Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much with God. But I want to tell you something tonight. It is amazing to be able to say we have the righteous man. Stand at the right hand of the Father praying for us tonight. Because when Jesus prays, he always gets what he prays for. And I'm saying this for a reason tonight. Because you know what's amazing to me? Here in our text, we see of all the disciples, it's Peter that's standing up here in the 120. And what he's about to announce is the need, according to Scripture, for someone to replace Judas. That got me thinking about Peter and about Judas. In many ways, they are polar opposites, but in other ways, they're very similar. For example, they were both apostles. For example, they both held positions of responsibility, i.e. Peter was the chief speaker amongst the apostles and Judas, of course, was the treasurer. Both spent three years with the Lord Jesus. They ate with him. They traveled with him. They heard some of the greatest words that were ever um, spoken. They seen some of the greatest miracles that were ever performed. And you think about that last supper. Jesus said, Something deeply unsettling to both men. First of all, he says this. All of you are going to forsake me and flee. And of course, Peter speaks up and he said, Lord, though all men forsake you, I will not forsake you. And Jesus responds to Peter and he says this to him. He says, Peter, before this night is out, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny that you even know me three times. And again, Peter says, not so, Lord. And all the rest said the same thing. And then the night goes on. We know that as Judas goes out into the night to portray Jesus, that they they go out into the streets of Jerusalem. They go across the Kidron Valley. Jesus goes into the garden, becomes greatly troubled. He leaves eight on the periphery. Takes Peter, James, and John into the midst of the garden. And then we're told that he begins to become sorrowful, very heavy. And he prays that famous prayer, Father, if it's possible, would you let this cup pass from me? Comes back and then sees Peter sleeping, tells him to rise and pray. Goes back again, prays the same thing twice more. And then comes back to his disciples again. He says, rise, let us be going, for my betrayer is at hand. And at that point, we're told that the band, of course, comes with Judas. And what does Peter do? He takes a sword out of his sheath. And he cuts off the servant of the high priest's ear. His name was Malchus. Now, someone say he wasn't trying to cut off Malchus's ear. Peter wasn't a swordsman, he was a fisherman. <laughs> he was trying to take Malchus's head off. And brothers and sisters, 
Jesus said, Peter, put away your sword, for those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. Do you not know that I can pray now to my Father, and he will give me more than 12 legions of angels, 172,000 angels? Of course, the band leads Jesus away to the palace of Caiaphas and Annas. Peter, we're told, is following at a distance, and we know what happens next. He's sitting warming himself at the enemy's fire, and three times he denies his Lord before a young servant girl. And we're told that when he denies the third time, the rooster crows. And Jesus turns and looks at Peter. Isn't it amazing, by the way? God's sovereign over roosters. <laughs> you think that God doesn't know about your circumstances? God knew exactly when that rooster would crow. And he knows about you tonight. You see, at that moment, when Peter got that look, we're told he went out into the night. And he must have been thinking... It's all over for me. I've lost the apostleship. And he repents with bitter tears. But of course on resurrection morning he's relieved because when the risen Christ rises from the dead he gives a message to the angels to give to the women. He says, go and tell my brothers that I will meet them in Galilee again. And do not forget about Peter. I'm going to use him. Do you know, Peter of course is restored on the shores of Galilee. And then he's recommissioned to lead the New Testament church. But we also know there was another statement that Jesus made that night. Here's what he also said to those disciples. He says, tonight, one of you is going to betray me. Jesus knew that because we're told that even a few days earlier, Satan had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. He'd already went to the chief priests and the Pharisees to get those 30 pieces of silver. They all begin to wonder, who is it? Do you know what Jesus says next? He says, the Son of Man is going as it is written of him in the Scriptures. But here's what he said, woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man that he'd never been born. And then at the supper that night, Peter Shouts across to John who was lying on the Lord's breast at supper. Ask the Lord who is his betrayer. And John asked Jesus and Jesus said, the one that betray, is going to betray me is the one who dips with me in the bowl. And we're told that the Lord took the sop and he gave it to Judas. And Judas said, is it me, master? Jesus says, it is you, Judas. What you do, do quickly. Judas goes out into the night when Satan enters into him. Where did he go? He must have went to the high priest's palace. He must have received his money. He must have received the ban because then he goes across the Kidron Valley into the Garden of Gethsemane and he approaches Christ and he's given the band a, a, a signal. The one that I kiss is the one you have to take. And you know what we're told next? That he approaches Jesus and Jesus says, Judas, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Do you know, isn't that amazing, by the way? One man says Judas was the man who stood at the gate of heaven and went to hell. I would go a step further and say Judas kissed the gate of heaven and went to hell. You know what that tells me tonight? You can be around the people of God. You can be around the things of God and never yet take that step to become a Christian. That was Judas. Of course, the band again lead Jesus away to the palace and we don't hear anything else about what happened to Judas that particular night. But what I do know is this. He must have been at Pilate's judgment seat. Because we're told this. When he had seen that Jesus had been condemned, he was remorseful. And he began to go into the temple again. Now, I was in Jerusalem, as I said, a wee while ago. And what I thought was amazing, I, I was thinking about this. Jesus is condemned to die. And he goes to the north, out the, the Damascus gate, to there die at the place of the skull, Calvary. And at the exact same time as Jesus is going one way to his destiny, Judas is going to the south, back into the temple again. And he goes into that temple and he, 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 he throws the coins down before the high priest. And he says, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. You know what they said? You see to it. What's that to us? And we're told that Judas went out, 
somewhere in Jerusalem, he hung himself and he went to hell. And this is the hypocrisy of these high priests. You know what they did? They said that because this 30 pieces of his blood money, we can't put this in the treasury. And they bought a field with it and they called it Akeldama, which means the field of blood. Now here's what I want to say tonight. Both men did despicable acts. One denied his Lord to his face. And by the way, there's some of those disciples who probably fully didn't grasp, just they knew he was the Messiah, but just the, the, that it's God in flesh standing in front of them. But I'll tell you, Peter wasn't one of them, brothers and sisters. Because Peter was the one who on the Mount of Transfiguration seen Jesus glorified right in front of him. And yet he denies the Messiah to his face. The other one betrays his Lord out of greed for the price of a slave. Now, how can it be that Peter is restored and Judas goes out and hangs himself? Why was Peter show mercy and Judas not show mercy? And you know, someone might say, well, it's pretty obvious, Stuart, it's because Peter really loved Jesus. And Judas didn't love Jesus. And of course, you would be correct in saying that. But it goes much deeper than this because the Bible gives us a clear answer tonight. It tells us that the scripture must be fulfilled. And whether we want to hear it tonight, Judas was always predestined to go to a lost eternity. The Old Testament prophecies point this out. Psalm 41.9 David even prophesies about Judas And what he would do to Christ. He said, my own familiar friend, the one that had bread with me has lifted himself up against me. You brothers and sisters and friends tonight, you see even you read Zechariah chapter 11. It will even tell you the amount of money that Judas took to betray Christ. I think that's absolutely remarkable. John chapter 6, many of Jesus' disciples walked away from him. Do you know what Jesus said to the twelve? Will you also go away? And Peter comes out with that great confession. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And you know what Jesus replies to the 12? He says, have not I chosen you 12? Listen to this. And one of you is a devil. Talking about Judas. John chapter 17, Jesus prays that great high priestly prayer. And here's what he said. Father, of all that you have given me, I have lost none, save the son of perdition or the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Now here's the question tonight. Why would it be misleading to say that Judas was merely a victim, a forces outside of his control? Because the fact of his betrayal, and it was foretold, it does not mean that he was not responsible for his actions. Would you say amen to that? Any more than the Old Testament predictions of Jesus dying meant that he did not die voluntarily, but of course he did. Do you know what I want to say to you? God's sovereignty does not negate man's responsibility. The two go hand in hand. And however strong Satan's influence must have been, Judas opened himself up to it. He was a thief. And even in the upper room, Jesus still made a final appeal to this man. Woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. And even in Acts chapter 1 here in our text, Peter holds him accountable because he said he bought this field as a reward of his own wickedness. And furthermore, Judas in that temple that day acknowledged that he himself was responsible because he said, I have betrayed the innocent blood. I want to say this to you tonight. Friend, be careful of the choices that you make. And the decisions you take, Jesus said it is impossible to serve God and to serve money. And the pursuit of worldly things has led many a person to a lost eternity. But why was Peter show mercy? The Bible again is crystal clear on this. You know why? I love this. Because Jesus was praying for Peter. Let's go back to the upper room. Jesus said something else. Here's what he said. 
Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. My man goes back to Job. Do you remember that patriarch all those years ago? And I know that Satan didn't desire Job. The Lord presented Job to Satan because he knew how strong Job was. And of course, Job remained faithful. But here Satan's looking to have Peter. I would love to have seen what happened there. And the Lord was saying, Peter, you need to know something. You will not be able to stand against this enemy. This enemy will take you apart, Peter. But the reason you're going to make it, Peter, is because I've been praying for you. And I have prayed for you that your faith does not fail. And when you are converted, I want you to strengthen your brethren. Peter, even though you will rebel against me, you will be restored and you will be recommissioned. And when you come out of this living hell, you will serve and strengthen your brothers. Notice Jesus doesn't say you might be converted or perhaps you'll be converted. He says to Judas or, or to Peter, you will be converted. I brought this last week to my own people. And I think it's relevant for here tonight as well. I was sitting at the garage in Doak. And uh, I had to, told Pastor Ken I had to come out of the garage because God gave me a prophetic word. And I wrote it into my notes. And this was the word. Perhaps it's relevant for someone here tonight. Brother and sister and friend, the Lord told me to tell our people, and you tonight as well, there's many times when we have walked away from Christ. As the hymn writer said, we've grieved him by a thousand falls. But the Lord wants to let you know tonight, the reason you are back, the reason you are in fellowship is because he's been praying for you. But I want you to know something. you know what else the Lord told me? Tell my people that now that they are converted, they're not to be living for their own selfish desires and their own selfish pleasures, but they're to live for the glory of God. Peter was in danger, you see. See, even after Jesus had risen and said he'll meet them in Galilee, do you know what Peter does? He's on the shores and he's thinking about going back to his old life. Here's what he says. I'm going back fishing. I'm going back to the old life. And of course, the Lord was merciful to Peter. That's the word of the Lord for someone tonight. As tragic as it is, we don't hear any such prayer for Judas. The scripture is silent. In fact, all that we're told, as I've already said, that the scriptures had to be fulfilled regarding his futures. And brothers and sisters, we might not like this, but the truth of the matter is this. Jesus didn't pray for everybody. There's a silence. You know what Jesus prayed in John chapter 17? I do not pray for the world. But I pray for those that you have given me out of the world. That they might be one as we are one, Father. That you would keep them from the world. I have kept them in your name and none of them is lost. But the son of perdition, Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Peter was prayed for. Judas wasn't. Peter went on to a great future. Judas went out into his own place and went to hell. And you know, brother and sister tonight, as I come to a close, that's why we should take great comfort in our salvation. Would you say amen to that? Because the reason we are going to make it is the same God who prayed for Peter and brought him through is praying for us tonight. And I know some of you may have went through a dark night of the soul. And some of you even here may not have been in that place, but may well go into that place in future days. But I want to tell you something. To see if you belong to him, he's never going to let you go. Paul shows us how secure we are in Romans chapter 8. Know what he says? All things work together for good. To those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. Isn't that absolutely amazing? Why, Paul, can you say something like that? Here's what Paul says. Because those whom God predestined before time, he foreknew. And those whom he foreknew in time, he called, saved. 
And those whom he called, he also justified or forgave. And those whom he justified, them he also glorified. You know what Paul was saying? From eternity past, all the way through time, to eternity to come, he says, we're in his hand and he's never going to let us go. That's why he can go on to say, what shall we say to these things then? Since God is for us, who then can be against us? He goes on to say, who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. And then he says this. He says, if God did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us, how will he with him, not with him give us all things? In other words, if he give us the greatest gift, his son, then he's going to give us all the little gifts as well. Who will separate us from the love of God? In Christ Jesus, the answer is no one and nothing. Because Jesus stands at the right hand of the Father even now, you're going to make it through because he's praying for you. One man said this, Robert Murray McShane, I think it was. I thought it was beautiful. He said, if I could hear the Lord Jesus praying for me in the next room, I wouldn't fear a million enemies. But know what he says next? He says, distance makes no difference because he is praying for me. It finishes in verse 21 to 26. They had to replace Judas, so they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas and Matthias. And then it shows us which of the two were to be chosen. And they done it by casting lots. Now someone, uh, some may argue and say, well, was this not a bit of a gamble that they were taking? No, brothers and sisters. Because this was the mode that was used good few times in the Old Testament to determine God's sovereign purposes. And the lot fell upon Matthias. There was no mistakes. God knew who he was choosing. Do you know what the Bible says as I close? The lot may fall into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. And perhaps God has drawn someone here tonight to hear this message. And I just want to say to you, you're not here by chance. God is in full control and he wants to draw you to himself. So Stuart, what was the difference between Peter and Judas? The difference between Peter and Judas is that Christ prayed for Peter and Christ is praying for you tonight. May God bless his word to each of our hearts. Let's pray. Father, I think about the words of the hymn writer, depths of mercy can there be Mercy still reserved for me. Can my God his wrath forbear me, the chief of sinners spare? Long have I withstood his grace, long provoked him to his face, wouldn't hearken to his call, grieved him by a thousand faults. Whence to me this waste of love? Ask my advocate above, see the cause in Jesus' face, now before the throne of grace. There for me the Savior stands, shows his wounds and spreads his hands. God is love, I know, I feel. Jesus lives and loves me still. Father, I pray that your people would know that they are being held in that omnipotent hand. I pray that your people would be comforted tonight. And I pray, Father God, that your people would know that you are praying for them. But Lord, if there's someone here, and Father, they're holding between two opinions. Lord, we believe tonight that the scripture must be fulfilled with regards to that man, Judas. But Lord, your sovereignty did not take away from the fact that Judas was responsible. He made the wrong choices. And I pray that someone sitting here tonight would not make the wrong choices, would not sell the pearl of greatest price, for what this world has to offer, but indeed that they would come to accept you tonight, to whom to know is life eternal. Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. Thank you for your love towards us. Bless this word to your people tonight. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Pastor Ken, thank you.